please. And if you just put a message in the chat bar. Good afternoon, everybody. Welcome to this meeting of the Barbican Residential Committee. A recording of the public meeting will be available via the link on the website for up to one civic year. Please note online meeting recordings do not constitute the formal minutes of the meeting. Minutes are written and available on the City of London Corporation's website. Recordings may be edited at the discretion of the proper officer to remove any inappropriate material. Whilst we endeavour to live stream all of our public meetings, it is not always possible due to technical difficulties. And in these instances, a recording will be uploaded following the end of the meeting. Thank you, Chair. Great, thank you very much, Town Clerk. Um, so for members of the public or uh, members of the committee and officers observing this, uh, I'm Mark Wheatley. I'm the chairman of the Barbican Residential Committee. It's my pleasure to welcome you all to this meeting. We've got a fairly busy agenda and um, we'll trip through the various items. But before we do so, um, I would like to pay tribute to several officers who have left the corporation or are about to leave it. Um, first, Ros Ogwu, who has, I think, performed sterling work keeping the Barbican estate together and focused and moving forward um, as an interim employee. She has left, but you know, she was greatly, uh, greatly appreciated by both residents and uh, colleagues. Uh, Jason, uh, I can't see you. You're you're down to my left, but you know, you've been a stalwart employee of the corporation for many years. And I know various residents who quite rightly push us, nudge us, uh, but privately you say and express their great thanks to you for everything you've done. Um, so we'll miss you, Jason. Um, Anne Mason, Anne, you, um, you know, you've borne with our under-resourcing, the uh, complications that members give to uh, the constraints on your reporting of accounts, um, and you've been in the, the, you know, the intersection of residence and the corporation for well over two decades. You, you're a courteous, incredibly diligent colleague, and I just want to say a personal thanks, but I think that would be echoed by all members of this committee, and I think residents as well, and trust residents as well. So thank you very much for all of your service, and hope you're looking forward to your trips. Norway, I think, is that right? Marvellous, thank you, Anne. And um, finally, not a direct um, report to this committee as such, but Alan Bennett has been our legal, sage legal guide for again over two decades, um, a person of great you know, aplomb, wit, courtesy, uh, precision, um, all the things you'd want in a lawyer uh, without the expense. Um, Alan, uh, thank you very much. So um, without a further ado, it's a bit like being one of those Oscar people when, when you're reading a list like that, but all fine, fine folks. Um, do we have any members declarations, Town Clerk? Sorry, do we have any apologies? Hello, Chair. Yes, um, we've had apologies um, from Anne Corbett, Madish Gupta, Andrew McMurtry and Paul Singh, and those members are joining us remotely. Great, thank you very much, Town Clerk. Um, members declarations, item two. Hello. Sure, if those of us that are Barbican residents need to give declarations every meeting or it's just taken as read. Providing your uh, DPIs and uh, non on non pecuniary interest are on your web page you don't have to but if you think that there's a specific issue and you haven't got a dispensation to speak on something you should make that known at the meeting and either recuse yourself or make it clear that you will not be participating on voting in an item if you if that if you believe it is engaged great thank you town clerk and helen any other declarations members Fine, then both the declaration and an apology for my oversight earlier. Um, we're talking about departures. We also have arrivals and Dan, um, you've been with us now, I suppose, approaching a month, uh, uh, new head of the Barbican Estate. Uh, Dan, do you, do you want to say a few words before we proceed? But um, you're heartily welcome to this committee as well as to the corporation. Thank you, Chair. Um, I think I met uh, a few of you already, but very happy to be here. Uh, looking forward to driving the Barbican forward, uh, making it a great place to to live, work and enjoy. Um, so very much looking forward to, to the work. Marvellous, thank you, Dan. And right, members, without further ado, we'll get into the minutes. You have them uh, from our uh, last meeting on page seven, running to page 16. Uh, we'll trip through them fairly quickly. I'll take them for accuracy and uh, matters arising. Page seven. Page eight. Page nine, ten, eleven, twelve, thirteen, fourteen, 
and 15. Right, we're through the minutes then. Um, members, anything you want to, have I rushed you too quickly? Is there anything you want to draw out? No, I think Town Clerk were content with the minutes being accurate. Um, we'll move on to um, the Bobkin Residential Con Consultation Committee. Um, it's our standard practice to invite the chair of the committee to speak and introduce uh, their minutes. Our members content that we should do so again. Marvellous. Sandra, over to you. Thank you, Chair, and thank you once again for giving me the opportunity to um, address you all as um, to, as a supplement to the minutes from the RCC. Um, I hope you'll bear with me because I'd like to do just a, a little preamble because particularly before Christmas, the meetings that I attended, there was quite a lot of um, um, dissatisfaction, I think is fair to say, and I'm sure that it was difficult to listen to some of the things I was saying and it was pretty difficult to deliver some of those messages. I wanted to just say that it seems to me that we've turned a corner. Um, we've got um, some new people who are who are vigorous, solutions oriented, lots of common sense, energetic, undertaking planning, having discussions with us about ideas they have about improvements and generally uh, working together as sort of partners rather than us and them, which was sometimes the case. Um, there's still a huge amount to do, but we're on the right track and um, there's, there is a mountain to climb. But if you wouldn't mind me taking that analogy too far, I think we're at base camp and we've got the right people and capabilities to get us to the top and the right uh, equipment. So I think we're on our way. Um, I don't know about oxygen equipment, but uh, we're, we're on our way. I think that um, that feeling was reflected in the last meeting of the RCC, which was rather more positive and a two way discussion, much more um, amiable. There weren't any points of potential friction. Um, we, 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 we agreed that we'd be delighted to see Dan. He's hit the ground running and he's doing a great job for us and pro provides lots of confidence in the way ahead. Um, turning to the minutes now, the um, just a couple of things that I wanted to, to highlight um, on um, item 3B, the deferred payment scheme for leaseholders. We're looking forward to having a discussion on that because we know that some of our neighbours are having problems with service charges and um, we need to, 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 to get that sorted soon. Um, on over page on E, um, there is a, a, a bit of um, concern about the asbestos in the meter cupboards. We, we, we've known for a long time that we've got asbestos in our cupboards and we all know that if it's not disturbed, then it's not a problem. Um, but um, the energy companies are pushing people to get smart meters, which means they have to change the meter. And every time it happens, somebody says, mm, but I've got asbestos in the cupboard. And there's sort of a, a concern. Um, we, we discussed it at the RCC and uh, Dan and colleagues agreed that it needs to be to be looked at and that we need to have a sort of a planned approach to this because some of these cupboards are also going to be replaced when the door as parts of the door set. So we don't want to have a hugely expensive exercise to deal with the asbestos in the cupboards now. Um, when there's going to be an exercise to remove a lot of them during the that program of work. So that it just needs some planning and some communications. Um, we were delighted to hear that the um, uh, the town clerk approved the proposals from the special BRC about the budgets and that um, it was noted that we were going to undertake a root and branch review of the service charge budgets, how they're compiled, justified, managed, monitored and presented. Um, and um, I know that in discussions with Dan, we've we've discussed that and he too has those aspirations. Um, the service level working party unfortunately had to report again that there were difficulties um, over monitoring service levels because the uh, Civica system is still not working properly. And it was reported that the consultant that had been brought in to sort it out um, has solved some issues, but in, in the, the upgrade, some, some new ones had been um, had appeared and they were being taken forward. Um, we um, on major works, a huge amount of, of activity on major works, um, a lot of work on uh, water penetration, which is probably one of the biggest 
problems on the estate at the moment. Um, and we've had a number of meetings with um, the, the experts that have been brought in to, to solve the problems, temporary repairs with a view to permanent repairs and identifying the and diagnosing the problem rather than just treating the symptoms, um, which we, 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 we've all agreed that that has been a problem in the past, that people have treated the symptom, of course, as we know, water finds another way of getting in and therefore we've still got a problem. Um, that seems to be well in hand and plans are apace. The temporary repairs are going well. Um, of course, residents who've got water in their flats are still pretty unhappy. And um, so it's com communications is important to keep them up to speed and also um, unaware of the plan that the priorities, the priority cases are, are getting the temporary fixes as soon as they can be done. Um, it's going to be a long job. <laughs> A very long job, but we understand that and we're delighted that um, it's been dealt with the way it is. Um, redecorations has continues to be problematic. We were slightly disappointed that the report again didn't actually mention that there were still problems, uh, that there was an outstanding formal complaint. Um, and in discussion, we agreed that maybe there was a this was a good, good opportunity to have a lessons learned exercise. Um, just to, to to find out what hadn't worked so well, what would work well, and make sure that we didn't, um, you know, have the same problems in the future, either on the redecorations programme or any other programme. Um, the window cleaning contact is to be retendered. Slightly disappointed that that's not going ahead, although we do get the benefit of the cheaper contract being extended. So it's it's not all bad. Um, Brand and Muse Canopy, um, this has been on the RCC agenda for as long as I've been on the RCC, which is quite a long time. Um, and I'd sort of lost the plot on, on, on what the problem was. Um, so I reminded myself, I mean, the problem is that the canopy, which was put on to, um, because there were, were leaks, um, is now filthy. It is green and dirty and needs cleaning. However, um, it can't be cleaned because the um, the material is degraded to the extent that if you try and clean it, it's it's brittle. So um, we're a bit we're a bit stuck stuck. And um, the issue is who's going to pay for whatever needs to be done, um, which is why there's been this huge exercise with lawyers. Um, and um, the vast quantity of papers that you've got. Um, and I think there's still a lot of work to be done on that. And the chair of the uh, Brandon Muse um, House Group um, was urging us at the RCC and asked me to bring forward at this committee that he believes there's still some work to be done on um, identifying exactly who should be paying for what and um, and when. But, you know, you won't be surprised to hear that, of course. <laughs> um, I think, Chair, that's the summary of my highlights. Thank you very much. Um, so work in progress, uh, more to do, but we are you know, getting on with the job. And thank you very much for appreciating the work that officers are putting in. Um, some of those points we will be coming back to on our own agenda, like Brandon Muse, for example. Um, members, any other thoughts, observations at this stage before we proceed onwards? Fine, Sandra, thank you so much for um, uh, presenting those, um, thank you, Chair. those considerations. Thank you. Thank you, Chair. Um, we now have the resolution from the Barbican Residence Consultation Committee. Great, thank you very much, uh, Town Clerk. Um, I've got two Town Clerks, so uh, please forgive me going into um, first names. Uh, Julie, thank you. Um, Polly will talk us through the precise process, but um, because this uh, resolution has some potential impact for me as an individual, I'm going to uh, step away, indeed step out of the room um, and ask the senior member present, Helen Fentiman, to take the chair in the meantime. Um, so uh, thank you very much and over to you, Polly. Uh, thank you, Chairman. Uh, and turning to the uh, temporary chairman, uh, as uh, Mr Wheatley takes his leave from the room, I, I have to flag that with Mr Wheatley leaving, it would uh, uh, briefly render this uh, meeting in court. And so I would propose that a discussion be, well, with well, as Mr Wheatley leaves, agree to uh, 
briefly adjourn the formal meeting, noting that this discussion will hopefully not take very long and an informal discussion on the proposals take place, which also will allow those members of the committee dialing in virtually to participate in the discussion. That discussion then can inform an urgency uh, to be considered either by myself as assistant town clerk or Greg as deputy town clerk after the meeting. So just to clarify for, for those members of the public watching and for members in the room about that process. Uh, but the chair of the RCC, Sandra Jenner, has uh, asked if uh, she would like to speak to this item. So with the the now chair's leave, um, it's, it's up to you if uh, we could. Uh, with the now chair's leave, we'll invite uh, the chair of the RCC to, to speak to the resolution. Thank you. Thank you very much. Um, we wouldn't normally even dream of um, interfering with the procedures and the processes of um, the city in terms of the appointment of a chair or the extension of a lease of a, of a term or whatever. But um, when we heard that um, the chair of the BRC's term was almost up, um, it caused us much concern because of the, the position we're in with regard to the, the transformation of the, uh, the, the um, BEO. Um, his, he, at the moment, Mark is Mark Wheatley is on the uh, transformation board. We're in the middle of our, our work. As I said earlier, there's a huge amount still to be done. We've got some the people in place, but there's a huge amount of delivery to be done. And we felt they could, could only be to the detriment of the programme if we had to um, um, it, introduce a new chair to, to where we are and take them forward provided an in-depth briefing um, and hence the suggestion that um, the, the resolution that um, the ex to extend the term of office of the current chair by a year. I put this to the RCC at the meeting and it was um, agreed unanimously. There was not a single person who didn't think it was the right thing to do. Um, I'd be, I'm grateful to you for um, considering it. Thank you. Chair, if I could I clarify the process from here on in for um, so it should uh, members be supportive of this in principle and subject to the urgency decision that may ensue thereafter, the recommendation would go to policy and resources committee and then on to the Court of Common Council at its April meeting. So subject to, to views in the room and I obviously up to members. I, I should probably also stress that uh, the Mr Wheatley has indicated he's comfortable for this item to be taken in public, but of course, uh, not that we've been made aware of any, but if members did wish to express any concerns, it might be more appropriate for those to be in non-public. But uh, we'll, I'll sort of have, I don't know what members are going to say, so we'll have to cross that bridge. Steve. Thank you, Chair. Um, I just think it might be useful um, for you to outline why we're being asked to do this, because we haven't yet done that in the context of this meeting, and I think it would be good for you to do that. The resolution from the RCC, which the chair of the RCC has outlined their reasons for this, but I have to uh, sort of with my governance hat on, I can see why in this instance that the, the need has come around. I actually in, in the call over for this meeting noted that the vast majority of the members of this committee started at the City Corporation within the last two years. So where you have succession planning on a number of committees that's happened quite naturally, you have uh, this committee has rather uniquely found itself in a position where you have uh, almost the entirety of the membership have only been on the committee for two or less years, uh, which is quite a unique situation. So and that is a, a, perhaps an exception that might help in terms of the context of the, the origin. But oh, do you mean in terms of the rules around it? Fine. Well, Sorry. Yes. You know, you forget what you you know. Um, so it, within the Corcom Council standing orders, uh, the standing order 29 around chairman, uh, most committee chairs can only hold the role for three years, a maximum of three years. There are some exceptions to that. For example, the policy chairman, the finance chairman, the police chairman, Barbican Centre. It's a growing number of exceptions, but I, they are still in the minority. Uh, and those, those are longer based on a service need and an industry standard for that area. So, for example, art centre chairs generally hold a term for four years rather than three. Uh, so those are they all have individual reasons as to why those exceptions are made uh, and that that's based on service need. And it is very much for members to either support or not support. It's a very much a matter for members to take this, this forward. There is no uh, legal reason beyond us changing our own internal governance uh, framework 
that to, that would restrict this decision is one for you. Um, in the absence of seeing any other hands or um, indications in the room, um, perhaps I could uh, just add that as a member of the transformation board, I think this is such a sensible uh, resolution of proposal. I can. Um, I think that given the stage of the work, albeit Sandra saying think we've turned a corner, there is still a substantial amount of work to be undertaken and the transformation board, but in the Barbican estate more generally. And I think it's eminently sensible that um, this motion comes to us and thank you to the RCC for putting it. Um, I think um, I'm actually technically not allowed to vote, but if I were, I would certainly be putting my hand up to this. I, I probably at that point chair ought to, to signal that although uh, this could go to court and to allow the principle for this to happen, it will still be subject to Mr Wheatley putting his name forward at the relevant meeting and indeed anyone else putting their name forward and any uh, you know, ballot taken thereof. So this would not be an installation of a particular member. It would still go through exactly the same process. The the what if this recommendation is adopted and it goes forward, it will simply allow Mr Wheatley to stand, whereas before he wouldn't have even been permitted to stand. So it's taking that barrier away, which I think is an important clarification. Should you get new members of this committee that choose to put their name forward, it would then be up to the membership of this committee to vote on who they believe is the most appropriate chair. Uh, thank you, Polly. Oh, Greg oh, sorry, Greg. Uh, it, just a very quick point, just to say in, in purely technical terms, what you're seeking from the Common Council is a waiver of Standing Order 29-2 and the, the application for the Barbican Residential Committee. So it's a one year, one time only thing to provide the opportunity uh, for you to re-elect Mr Wheatley should you so wish and should he put his name forward. Uh, this has been done a couple of times in recent years that I can rule to you off the top of my head. So um, the Capital Buildings Committee, when it was a grand committee uh, and things were in transition, they said because of a transition period we would uh, seek to extend the arrangements. Uh, and the Epping Forest uh, and Commons Committee a few years ago when the um, uh, the heir apparent for the chairmanship uh, left the court and therefore there was nobody lined up. The incumbent chair was um, <laughs> asked by his colleagues on the committee if they wouldn't mind doing another year uh, and sort of semi reluctantly agreed to do so. So the committee again put forward a proposal for a waiver of the relevant standing order. Uh, I'm sorry I couldn't be there in person today, by the way. I've been stranded by the train strikes. So uh, apologies for any sound issues. Thank you, Greg. And I think I suppose what I'm saying is that um, if I've understood you correctly, Polly, what we're being asked to do is to say whether or not we support the proposal to go through to the next stage of process. <clears throat> and in that sense, I'm certainly from a personal perspective would say absolutely yes. But um, I, I guess, Tim. Uh, absolutely. I think Mark has been a superb chair and we're at, we're at a time of such change that the continuity that his continuation would give would be really, really helpful. So I also would very much support uh, this one year extension. I can't see any other members um, on the screen who want to contribute. So I think it's back to you, Polly, for the final stage of this then. Thank you. Uh, I'm sure uh, Mr McMurtry won't mind me noting that uh, his support uh, from the from the chat, especially as we because we can't formally agree it because we are in court. So what will happen is that uh, Julie as clerk to the committee will draw up a note to be considered under urgency or then go to the policy and resources meeting this Thursday. And if they approve it, it will go to the court, full Court of Common Council for all members to vote upon uh, at the April meeting as part of the well, either put it in the white paper or I think Greg is the plan. Uh, so that's where people can see it and vote on it again there, particularly as we're noting now that we're in sort of on informally supporting it, it gives a opportunity for members to do there. So um, as we can't move to a formal vote to close off the item, <laughs> Chair, with your leave, I will go uh, get the other chair back in the room. Oh, thank you, Mr. Goodman. Thank you. How many times can you say chair in a, in a minute period, I think? Thanks, everybody.
We're now on item six, Chairman. Welcome back. Thank you. Thank you, Town Clerk. Uh, right, moving on to item six, the actions tracker. Uh, Pam, I think you're going to take us through this. Sorry, Chair. We'll start with the first one. So um, it's just an update on um, plan maintenance of public realm of the works to Bar Barbican Podium Phase 2. Um, that's proceeding to the right sort of gateway process. Um, next one, there was also an issue about um, uh, using the some of the funding that we have to purchase plans of the estate from Arab and we are talking to officers from building control. I think there was some um, push against this at the RCC meeting because people thought there might be better use of that funding and officers said we would go away and look at that. Also, people have given us different sources of the of the plans and it might be we might be able to get them from elsewhere. Um, so more work to be done on that one. Emma is online to pick up the energy update. Hi, good afternoon. Uh, thank you, Pam. Um, yes, yeah, so um, the update is that we are uh, having a kickoff meeting with PCMG, the uh, specialist provider of the energy audit, audit um, this Friday at three o'clock uh, with uh, Sally Spensley, Francois Javier and uh, Ted Riley in attendance. So uh, I can finally uh, wave the flag and say we're, we're getting this underway. So thank you very much uh, for your patience, everybody. Great, thank you, Emma. And of course, me, a resident engagement, as you highlight, but um, any things that need to be sort of brought forward before that meeting from members of the committee or otherwise? No, nope. it seems like you have a good process and you have good people. So um, we'll move on with the updates. To Jason. Um, Lama Jones Muse, I think it confirmed at RCC with regards to the repairs um, originally undertaken uh, despite change of contracts during the works, we still delivered the project within the original contract value. Um, next item is a transformation board for which there's a paper chair on the on the in the papers that we've got before us today. Um, next one is Anne. Sorry, and it's just about the the, the, the service charge work started with Beaver Travel, which actually is also on the transformation program. Yes, they, they, they have started and um, we're hoping to arrange a site visit for them either at the end of this week or next week. Um, to confirm, we carry on meeting monthly with Ben Johnson House Representatives, a particularly good last meeting. Um, Jason, do you want to talk about Owen's work on balconies just quickly? I was going to pick up, but it's part of the major works okay. update report, if that's okay. Thank you. Um, and same with Graham's work on the windows, right? And the redex. <laughs> <laughs> okay, next one's you as well, the program. And yeah. I would update on that one very briefly. So um, I've spoken with Dan around sharing that terms of reference, getting that signed off. Um, setting up the, I guess, the next steps of membership, as we discussed earlier, uh, on the group, um, to try and get some progress with that uh, program board going forward. Um, and finally, we go back to the transformation board, which, as I said, is actually on the agenda today. Next one, again, the repairs and maintenance procurement update. Um, we are have put in some additional meetings to ensure that um, both Barbican residents and um, our housing management subcommittee get an opportunity to comment on the, um, the procurement at its next stage. Damon, next one to you. Window cleaning. Chair, yes, so uh, given the situation with the um, Tender for the last window cleaning uh, contract. We've now continued to roll on Parkers for a monthly uh, rolling month process up until the new tender goes out. And there is currently the first 
communications with the residents set up for the 18th of April. OK, and over to Helen about antisocial behaviour on the Barbican estate. Thank you, Pam. There is a report coming uh, later on about antisocial behaviour. This is about producing a leaflet and um, that's currently with colleagues. We've been working, Rosalind and I have been working on that this year and it's currently with colleagues just for their their views um, in the Safer City Partnership. Thank you. Helen, can I just jump in? Is that leaflet being run by David Bradshaw and his team as well? Yes, sorry. Um, it's being run past colleagues before being passed on to the Barbican Association Security Subcommittee. Great, thank you very much. Um, and the Brand Muse canopy, which we mentioned earlier, which the chair from RCC mentioned, is also on the agenda. And over to Judith for Blake Tower. The agenda, thank you. And again, Helen, the, the lease issue is on this agenda, Chair. Correct. Yeah. Um, oh, sorry, let's get past the, with that. Um, so, sorry, I'm just, so this is the issue, outstanding issue around the tender documents for agency staff contracts um, and actually we haven't resolved this chair because it's not a BRC decision. No, I think we were going to come back to this as a question yeah. later, but I'm wondering whether it's an appropriate moment to just touch on this. There are sensitivities that would mean you know, details here have to be considered in private session, potentially even in consultation at some point. But Helen, um, can you maybe just tease forward that point from earlier? <laughs> Uh, yes, thank you. It's it's simply to say that um, I have had an email from uh, a resident just in the last couple of days raising some concerns about some process points around this issue. Um, because of the nature of the topic, I think the, any detailed conversation needs to be in non-public, but we should note that we have got residential concerns about process. On the general points of sort of communicating and clarifying and sort of you know, engaging with people, we, we do hear those and we are going to address them. So thank you very much, Helen. Anything else on the um, uh, the actions tracker that needs teasing out at this stage? The only other issue which I think um, Emma's now not, I don't know if Emma's still on the call, she is. So Emma, it was just about the underfloor heating working party. Yes, yeah, sure. That. So this is um, being looked after by my colleague Ed Tran, but if there's a particular question, I think I can either do my best to answer it or, if, or I can take it away. Um, happy to take questions. Members, any questions about the underfloor heating? I think in that case, are we? Oh, Helen. Yes, thank you. It's not a not a specific question about underfloor heating, but uh, generally, um, I was at uh, a meeting earlier this morning about the work of the climate action team and how it applies to housing and the meeting was from a CCS perspective but there are so many things that are relevant from our other housing estate that are also relevant to the Barbican estate um, and one of our conclusions was that we should uh, we should I don't know if it's a form in a workshop but certainly a briefing for members of this committee and CCS committee and specifically housing subcommittee when it's reformed in the new um, civic year uh, and perhaps rather than doing them as separate committees it, it might be useful to try and do it as, as one because so many of us overlap into one or other or all three uh, if that would be helpful because I think um, I think we're increasingly being asked to look at all repairs, maintenance, housing development through the climate lens, and I'm not sure that we always manage to do that for obvious reasons. Great, thank you, Helen. And of course, a distinct point, but yeah, I won't resist any opportunity to bang on about a housing committee. I think if we had one in the corporation, we might be able to look at those issues in a joined up way through a governance framework. But um, I'm sure the director has heard that and my own little rant. Good, thank you. Great, thank you very much. Um, so, um, members, this is for, for, for decision, but really the decision is to note the contents of the tracker. Um, are we all content to note them before we move on? Marvellous. Then in that case, let's go on to the Transformation Board and be informed about it. Pam, I think you're going to inform us. 
Thank you, Chair. So um, this is a report summarising um, for everyone's consumption uh, what the Transformation Board has been up to, that we have um, a number of work streams which are outlined, six, six work streams outlined in the report, uh, organisational design, customers, processes, technology and systems, performance and data and people and culture. Um, and as it says here, the board is chaired by Judith Finney as our executive director, and it tells you what members and residents are involved in it and officers. Um, and we have created a um, program monitoring tool that uh, captures everything that's in it. Most of the actions, uh, if not all of them, relate to the Altair report, which looked at the operation of the Barbican Estate Office and came up with um, various recommendations. So it's a way of uh, or putting those within the organisation, tracking them and making sure that we achieve against them. Um, the current position is that there are 51 actions captured in the programme. Um, eight have been completed, a lot are in progress, 31 and, and, eight, and eight have yet to be started. One of the things we have picked up as a programme board is that there is quite a, an overlap of some of the actions and we need to agreed uh, at, at the board that we need some of them need to be phased better so that they don't because they will often call on the same resources so that we have um, an end a clear endpoint and we know how all the phases fit in. Uh, we have included the work of the procurement program because one of the key issues highlighted from the very beginning was problems with the repair um, service and repair and maintenance service to the Barbican. Um, and then just quickly highlighting some of the achievements. Obviously, we have one with us today, which is having uh, Dan Saunders here as the AD for the Barbican. We have also appointed a new Assistant Director for Housing, who will start at the end, uh, towards the end of May. Um, we've um, got so a whole raft of posts that are just about to come out for interview, and Dan might want to say a bit more about that. Um, and uh, unfortunately, necessity of replacing Anne with her retirement. Um, this other couple of things I wanted to pick up was that we have agreed an extension of the Metwin contract, which does enable us to get on with the re-procurement for the future. Um, and I think that that's it from me. Do you want to highlight anything else? Uh, just touching on the, the staffing piece, so we are interviewing for uh, and replacement next week, as well as uh, head of property services role, um, which will be integral to uh, repairs, maintenance and the asset maintenance of, of the buildings longer term as well. So they're, they're underway. Great. Well, thank you both very much. Members, any points before we proceed onwards? Oh, Steve, uh, call your hand slightly first. So, so, so quick on the draw. Jane. Um, yeah, I, I suppose timescales is what I want to ask a question about. Um, and um, paragraph 18 talks about um, actions covering progress being completed by two weeks ago. Um, but I just wonder whether we could just have a broad understanding of uh, the, the, the timescales that we're, we're looking at. And, and also, I suppose, in terms of all the actions that are being taken, the confidence that officers have that we've got clear um, ways of measuring whether we've been successful in achieving those outcomes. Time scales and smart sort of objectives or whatever. Helen, should we take yours as well? Uh, it was a very similar point because I, I think that um, over the month there has been some frustration that some of these things have been taking a very long time to really get, get moving. Um, and I think that there are some things that kind of are going faster than others. But um, and whilst they're all extremely important, there are some quite big ones like the asset man management strategy, because so much is kind of pinned on that for both um, for, for, for this work, but the, the spill out into other areas as well to really understand the scale of what needs to be done and the cost of what needs to be done. And until we've got that, there are some things that just can't progress because there's basic information. We've had this conversation Dan and I'm confident that you'll be moving everything as quickly as possible but a similar point I think increasingly I'd quite like to see some um, review points if not deadlines for when work will be completed. Great thank you Helen. Uh, Judith given that you chair the board are you okay? Yeah no happy to do that so thank you I agree that um, timescales are an issue for us some of our timescales have slipped we uh, we 
we needed the right staff in the right place to be able to achieve some of the stretching time scales that we've given ourselves. We're now populating our structure in a way that will make a difference. And I think some residents can already see the impact of some of the staffing changes that we've got. We're happy to bring back a report the next time with, with more clarity on dates and time scales. Thank you. Great, thank you, Judith. Um, any other points, members? In which case, we'll move on to another information item, agenda point eight, um, which reflects the budgets. If, um, if members recall, uh, we weren't comfortable with the information provided at our last regular meeting. Um, I think that reflected serious concerns raised by members of the RCC. So we uh, we took uh, a special meeting, an informal meeting, uh, the deputy chairman and I in contact with the town clerk um, approved the budgets. But we, uh, if you turn to page 34, you'll see we we drew some lessons learned to A2F um, and uh, whilst the reports for information down are you okay just maybe teasing out some of those points in section five and um, and, and just informing members. Yeah, thank you chair. I think um, we, we recognise that um, the, the budget and the, the communications around the budget, um, you know, need to be clearer for our, our leaseholders and customers to be able to clearly interpret and, and understand um, and I think you know there's a, a lot of work going into that um, with both the, the subcommittee of the service charge um, and, and also you know the, the RCC um, but I think we acknowledge and we are putting putting things in place to, to make those um, easier um, the, the lessons learned is obviously very helpful um, and I think you know when we come to to the service charge for the next year um, we'll, we'll be in a very different place in terms of the, the literature and communication that is accompanied with that. Thank you Dan and um, those officers responsible for the doing. Um, John. Thank you Chair, could I just ask maybe a very silly question. Um, 3D uh, on the top of page 33, uh, what is, I couldn't didn't quite understand income in respect of the railway line. What does what does that mean? Something I've missed somewhere in the past two years. Thank you. Um, That's a very good question. Yes, it's it's a very old uh, ref reference. When the Barbican was built, there had to be alterations to the underground line underneath, um, and so there was there is um, an account that deals is partially dealing with the income and expenditure that goes historically a long way back to that old alteration for the building of the estate. Does that mean that there's money coming in or money going out? Um, there, there's both. Um, I believe there's both. There's money that, that is owed to um, the that goes to London Underground and there's there's money that comes in from other areas. There's also a substation um, which is we receive rent for, for where the sub the electricity substation is. So it's all it's all sort of peripherals to the, the estate. It's not really um, part a major part it's not income or expenditure that changes very much. Yeah. Great, thank you for the question. And Steve? Yeah, yes, Chair. I, I just wanted to uh, use this opportunity to re-emphasise, I think, a conversation we perhaps had at, at BRC rather than at this meeting about the nature of the budget that we set. Um, and I think that this was agreed that, you know, we set the, the budget in good faith. Um, we of course understand that we can't predict everything that's going to happen. But that should be a budget that officers attempt to achieve and that if we are overspending in any areas of that budget then we should be able to demonstrate that, that we are trying to mitigate the overspend in other areas and i think it would be well two things i think it's important that we can demonstrate that to residents i think it's also important that the language we use uh, is right so we we have a budget and then it's about the variances to that budget through the year, not that every meeting we're able to reset the budget that we've agreed at the beginning of the year. Thanks, Chair. So that point about fundamental confidence that we're setting realistic objectives and to realistic figures that we're then meeting them and communicating clar clearly about those. So there's not a blank check, essentially. Is that correct? So, yeah, yes, Chair. And no, I think also that we, we are demonstrating to residents that we're doing our best to stay within the budget that we set at the beginning of the financial year. Thank you, Steve. The officers will pick up Helen. Uh, th thank you. I'm, I think I just wanted to make some connections between the previous item, um, the Transformation Board and the budget setting. And in particular, there are particular pieces of work in the Transformation Board that will impact on the budget for 25, 26. 
Now, I don't know how early you start preparing the budget for 25-26, but it comes back to the point of the timelines for conclusions of some of the work, because clearly the outcome of the service charge audit, the new contract repairs and maintenance, et cetera, et cetera, will have a, an impact on, on what we say in the future. So it's, um, I guess I'm asking for some assurance that if those pieces of work are not concluded, then we will still be using best estimate or best guess at, at that time. But being clear <clears throat> that it is an estimate, that it's it's not necessarily the, the, the final figure, which comes back to the presentation with the narrative around the numbers, which makes some of those things ex expl explicit. Um, the other comment, which is a bit tongue in cheek, which comes back to the railway line, is there a deal to be done? with TFL and the railway line income expenditure, whatever it is, uh, and the um, problems that there are underneath Brandon News with the track noise. Great, thank you. So a kind of an overlap in items, but also the first part of your question with Steve's about the, sort of the confidence, the clarity, the communication. And then secondly, can we strike a deal with TFL potentially on, on the... Well, Sometimes those are the best questions to ask. So a bit, bit of creative one. Um, Judith, are you yeah, gonna... just just to confirm, you you can expect to see more rigor in our budget management um, going forward. Absolutely, that's the case. Uh, we'll we'll be learning from the service charge audits, the energy audits, and trying to build those in as far as we can. And the repairs and maintenance. Absolutely, we'll, we'll be using our, our our best efforts to make sure that we drive value, good value for residents out of out of those pieces of work, and that we we capture that properly in the budget setting process. Thank you. And anything on the trains? Trains, we'll take that away, Helen. Thank you. <laughs> well, we can assure you it's on track. Um, Jake, sorry. Um, moving on to uh, item nine, the, uh, unless members have any other questions. Uh, major works. Uh, Jason, I think you're going to talk us through this information item. Thank you, Chair. So the Windows update. So we reported within this report that there's a request for quotation specialist consultants to the window uh, repairs going forward on the more urgent windows that has completed. We've assessed that We're in the process of awarding that there will be a gateway report which comes through the next committee cycles once we've had chance to talk through with um, uh, the asset maintenance working party around what that timeline looks for, looks at for the um, the sort of longer term permanent repairs of the wood spliced um, as an example. The temporary repairs, despite all the April showers, have progressed and they are pretty much complete now. So we at least have our windows protected uh, from further water ingress and open properties in the same regard. Um, there was a question at the RCC about whether or not fencer was a requirement. And I confirmed and clarified that it was a desirability, so it would be helpful if we had the accreditation with the contractors but the assessment around their uh, competencies with dealing with heritage projects um, such as listed buildings for example and hardwood frames etc uh, was uh, perhaps more important but obviously the accreditations where the checks are completed regularly around uh, com compliance with building regulations is also um, important um, for the work going forward. Um, the internal external redecorations, uh, we noted at RCC that perhaps we could be a little bit more comprehensive in terms of the updates and, and the information about what is signed off and who signed what off at what point. So we take that away as, as good feedback uh, and obviously extend uh, the commentary on that accordingly for our next report. So, for example, if it's just the clerk of works that signed it off, then that will be indicative in the report. If it's the clerk of works and the project team that signed it off, that will also uh, show within the report going forward. Um, in terms of the water penetrations, we originally said it was around 50. Um, project manager has been really delving into it and meeting with, um, I believe, the service charge working party, and it's considerably more than the 50. And the important part is agreeing a specification around the cold pore, cold pore systems as well, and what the specification looks at going forward. Also identifying the uh, waterproofing that's required around this state too. So is it just isolated to a few areas or is it more widespread and how does that fit with our wider um, capital works program for the Barbican estate? Um, I did report that the um, lifts uh, at the moment are has shown better interest since um, I say residents were very accommodating in extending the uh, noisy working hours. So that's a positive note. 
Uh, and obviously, as part of my departure, I'll be handing over many of the Barbican projects to uh, colleagues going forward to ensure continuity for those. Thank you, Chair. Well, Jason, thank you for your diligence. Members will have questions, but you know, overall, you know, trying to be more programmatic, assuring on quality um, and having process controls. Tim. Thank you, Chair. Just wanted a clarification about something Jason just said. Uh, you said that FENSA certification was desirable, uh, but I understand there are two certifications. FENSA in itself, which is a subset of the Glass and Glazing Federation, provides a national scheme where if the contractor goes bust, you've got a, it's underwritten by the industry, and that is essential, not desirable. But the FENSA Heritage Specialist is, a, is an additional qualification, which is probably desirable, but not essential. And I think you misspoke yourself slightly when you said it. Distinct aspects. Jason, can you pick that up? Yes, um, you're absolutely right. So it, it, we're not looking at replacement windows either, which would then obviously trigger all the build regulations. We are looking at sort of bespoke one-off repairs for these window frames, so sort of splice timber repairs. One of the other things we're working towards is uh, what warranties come with those repairs from each of the contractors that they are insurance backs rather than um, backed up by the contractor so we can actually make those claims. I've spoken before and forgive me if I'm repeating myself, but I think identifying what windows have had what repairs and at what date is especially important so we can track them going forward and make those claims when we need to. I think sometimes we sort of lose track of where the repairs have been completed and, and really how far we are into that warranty period, particularly if that's ongoing. Um, one of the other important points I've raised before is around the regular inspection of those areas, particularly where the windows are more exposed. So, for example, the top floors would perhaps see a, a more regular inspection regime than those that are more protected across the estate. So it's not just about completing repairs, but what processes are in place to look after them once those repairs have been completed. Great. Thank you, Jason. John, I think you have. Thank you, Chair. Um, just a couple of questions, please, on the window repairs. Um, Thank you for your report. Thank you very much for this. Uh, you say that the temporary repair costs are not being recovered from leaseholders. I'm presuming then that the permanent repairs will be recovered from leaseholders. Thank Thank you. You. And the other thing is that properties will have the temporary repair undertaken and the permanent repair will be specified and may be undertaken in order to maximise the use and cost of the scaffold. Does that mean that once the scaffold goes up for the temporary repair, it is then going to have to wait there until the permanent repair is done. I've asked this because, as if you might remember, in the last um, meeting we had, I had a complaint from the people who had bought our flat in Bunyan that they had a scaffolding up for 10 months. Um, and I'm just hoping that that's not going to become a thing of the future. Thank you. I think we should avoid any prolonged scaffold um, erection as much as we can. The idea with the scaffold combination of temporary slash more permanent repairs is we've got a scaffold up and um, we can assess the repair there and then while the scaffold's in place and perhaps react more quickly to actually complete the, the splice wood repair, not necessarily replacement, but a splice wood repair whilst the scaffold is in place. If time allows us to do that without having, as you suggest, the scaffold up for 10 months. So if we can facilitate a repair pretty quick, it makes sense to use that scaffold and that one off cost rather than complete an exercise twice. And I just have one other question, if I may, please, about the um, redecorations. I note on page 39 that there's no internal works for Brandon News Briar or John Trundle, probably a very good reason for this, but no or no external works for Mount Joy or Seddon. Is that because they've already all, all been completed some time ago? Thank you. Specific details I wouldn't know offhand, but Brandon Muse was raised to me at the last RCC, and I, I promised I'd take the ways in action to look into why that was included within this programme of works. Briar or John Trundle? Um, no. I'd have to take that away as okay. a confirmation. Well, Steve, I think you've won again. Helen Welsh, that's because she's delegated me. Um, no, it's not, not, that's not strictly true. I mean, two, two issues I, I want to raise. I mean, firstly, this issue of when we are not able to do permanent repairs or other things quickly, uh, the extent to which when we have to do temporary repairs, um, that becomes a cost to leaseholders. Um, I, I suppose I'm, I'm a bit being a bit parochial at the moment because lifts in Shakespeare Tower, uh, usually there's one out of action. Uh, sometimes over the last uh, few weeks, there's been two out of action. 
Um, so I suppose that that's one issue. The other thing, which is again, is a bit maybe just me on the bottom page 44. You use the words the board will meet monthly in a hybrid format to ensure maximum attendance. It sort of made me think, have we got the people on board, the officers on board from other departments that we really need on board? I just think maybe we could have worded that a little bit different. I don't mind if people meet hybrid or not, but if, um, if, if Dan and others need them there to do the work, then we need to make sure they're going to be there. Thanks, Jane. So picking up on the first question, the longer term aspirations for the Windows contract is to have something in place, you know, long term with a schedule of rates attached to it so we can actually react and do a permanent repair each time rather than coming in with interventions. Unless, of course, it's it's immediately like a health and safety hazard, for example. So long term, we'll have a set of construction drawings which are procured and tendered and a schedule of rates which allows us to call off that as and when. And, you know, but that should form part of our inspection regime as well. Um, in terms of terms of reference, I don't think anything's necessarily set in stone around attendance and, and membership, but perhaps that can be something that Dan takes forward in terms of that frequency. Going. Just say something about the, the lifts, temporary repairs on lifts while we're waiting for the contract. Um, I'm not aware of any lifts broken down. I don't ha necessarily handle the repairs myself, so project wise I can answer questions, but not necessarily repairs. So I'll have to take that away. Okay, I'll take it away. Um, wasn't aware of a specific issue in Shakespeare, but I'll take it away and ensure that you know, as and when these things are, are reported, they're, they're captured somewhere so that we can see it through. Dan, you can maybe emailing Steve on that and copying in perhaps, well, any member of the committee who would like. Would all members like to see sight of that, have sight of that? If, if you're OK, could, could you maybe copy in the whole committee? Um, can I ask about uh, point eight on page 41? Um, I, I, I sense that uh, scoping is underway and you refer to solutions and remedies to 50 currently identified water penetration issues. Do we have any sense of the possible scale on this? 2000. So it's close to new 2000. There's a big long list of issues that have been raised and that's been filtered around commonalities and perhaps repetition, but just making sure those numbers are more realistic. In terms of Helen's point and Steve's about getting on with things, being realistic about the scale of challenge we face, do we need to bring anything forward now in that respect? Soon. I think, um, I suppose there's two things in particular that, that uh, concern me and, and forgive me because I am thinking about this as well as our HRA estate. So the, the kind of the two in my mind keep coming together and, and colliding. The, the scale of the problems that we have on both sides of our housing portfolio is enormous, yeah. absolutely enormous. And um, I think that this, and I, I just, I know I, I sound like a crack record because I keep repeating this. The sooner we know the scale of the financial problem and the work that has to be done, then the better. But secondly, and possibly as in, well, more importantly, possibly as important, is talking to residents across the piece about what we're doing and when something might be expected and to be indicating as far as we can be what impact there will be, not just in terms of the way they live their lives in their flats while work is being done, but the impact of, of, the, of the cost. And for many people, and we're going to have to address this sooner or later, but for many people, the challenge will be, but I've told you and told you and told you about these problems, and now I'm getting a much bigger bill because nothing happened at the, you know, when the issue was, was small. That is a serious problem and a significant concern to residents, and we can't just keep pretending that it's just the residents, it's just the residents. We have to tackle that and have a, a you know, a real conversation about it. Um, and I'd urge sooner rather than later, even if it's not conclusive sooner, we have to understand the, the baseline position and how we're going to respond. Early intervention. Um, officers, who's going to pick that up? Happy to answer part of that question, um, Chair. The, I think 
again, going back to what was said earlier, it's about assessing what the problem is rather than curing the symptoms in this case. And I think the officers will just need a, just a little bit of time just to assess the data that's in front and go through all those repairs. So originally it was 50 repairs and now it's 2000. That We just need to make sure that when we complete the works, it's actually going to solve the issue long term. A lot of the work on the Barbican, you know, is 50 years old, a lot of the construction's 50 years old, a lot of the infrastructure's 50 years old, and it's important that we address something that's going to perhaps last another 50 years. I think that's ambitious, um, but I think, you know, realistically, we need to make sure that we're not just putting sticky blasters on or maybe just curing a symptom and, and pushing that water penetration issue elsewhere. If we, if it's cheaper for us to deal with the whole balcony rather than the section of it, then it's something certainly we needs to be discussed as part of the programme board and what that capital works programme and obviously a list of priorities, but it's important right now uh, and what it's needed to smooth the curve of costs against leasehold recovery too. So I think there's going to be some sensible decisions, but not of the detriment to the estate or perhaps at risk of further issues or higher costs in, in the long term. Thank you, Jason. Yes. Um, it's not without going noted that some of these problems are just general maintenance stuff, you know, like just checking that the drains aren't blocked. You know, we know that that's a bit of a historic problem. Thank you. So we are um, doing a full review of our, our planned preventive maintenance programs across the estate to ensure that they're adequate in terms of, you know, drainage, um, you know, fires, everything to ensure that we can capture um, and hopefully shortly report to you on what that looks like in, in a real term basis to, to stop these issues at source and ensure that we're not adding to the problem. Well, the shame that we're actually having to have this conversation because these things should be being addressed as a matter of course, really. Yes, it might be that we're dealing with legacy issues culturally as well as to the fabric of the building. Um, you have Jason, Dan on top of it, but we've got a big job ahead of us and we really have to be clear about the gravity, the scale. And it's encouraging to hear Jason as, as he has before talking about getting to the root causes rather than the, the kind of the apparent symptoms. But I think for far too long, the corporation hasn't even been attending to the apparent symptoms. So maybe a housing committee would help. Um, but let's move on to unless um, members of the committee have anything else? Let's move on to item 10, the window cleaning contract retender, which was picked up earlier. Um, who's going to take this, Dan, you or Stephen? Or? Yeah, I can take it. Um, so uh, we have sent the uh, stage one section 20 consultation notice for the window cleaning uh, to leaseholders and we have a kickoff meeting booked in for the 18th of April uh, where we'll discuss the, the options around window cleaning. Uh, as was mentioned earlier, we've extended the contract, uh, no financial prejudice because they were the, the cheapest option uh, when we went out to tender the first time. Uh, and so we should be seeing some good progress on that over the next couple of months. Thank you, Dan. Members, any questions, comments? In which case, um, we need to take a decision. Um, can I just recall what the precise decision is? I'm sorry, I'm uh, in a Monday morning, a Monday afternoon, sorry, yes, um, kind of frame of mind. We're being asked to, in, it's page 47, we're being asked to endorse two recommendations, retendering of the window cleaning contract at the Barbican Estates and initial involvement from residents as I think there's a typo there as part of the mobilization panel in selecting a new provider. Are we content members with that? Marvellous. In that case, um, we are. And we will move on to uh, lease enforcement. Helen, I think. Thank you, Chairman. Um, so this report, which is for decision, um, is proposing a change to the protocol that was previously agreed by this committee in uh, 2018. I'm happy to take any questions. Thank you. And can you maybe flesh it out a little more, if that's OK, because some quite a few members of the committee are new. Yes, of course. So uh, this this um, this report, as I say, is an amendment to a previously approved protocol, uh, which just lays out um, so we're nice and clear to all residents um, how we will uh, enforce the lease and uh, when we will enforce the lease. Um, so this followed um, a great deal of consultation throughout 2017, 2018 originally, um, uh, producing the protocol. Um, as the report lays out, we've had a couple of cases um, that have caused us to review the protocol um, and there have been some minor changes. So uh, the new, um, the proposed, I should say, 
protocol is um, uh, the uh, first um, appendix. Thank you. Great, thank you, Helen. Members, any questions? Anna, oh, I can see your hand. Yeah, hi, uh, good afternoon. I, I would just like to suggest one change that we remove the word potentially vexatious complainants, that we have a category of vexatious complainants, because I think it's really hard to prove somebody's potentially vexatious. They're either vexatious or they're not. That's on page 54, and I think there's another reference somewhere else. So to guide members, it's at the foot of page 54, um, and there's a reference to potentially vexatious complainants, and then the text refers to if BO considers a complaint, so that's distinct from the complainant, to be a potentially vexatious complaint, they will be logged. Do we need the word potentially in there? Helen? We discussed this in call over and uh, City Solicitor agreed that we can we can absolutely remove the word potentially. Are members happy on the deputy chair's suggestion that we remove potentially? Oh, Helen. Uh, yes, I'm sorry. I'm, I'm happy that the, the potentially is review, um, removed, but uh, what I'm worried about is saying vexatious complainants. I think that um, if there's any suggestion that there's a a list anywhere of vexatious complainants as opposed to complaint, then it's problematic. Um, if if anybody was to ask a freedom an FOI and got a list of names of people who were said to be vexatious complainers, then you know I think that's problem that is a difficulty. So I think we just need to be very clear about the language that that how we present this. Yes, so complainant out, uh, potentially out, complaint. Yes, and we have the word consider in there, but uh, Tim. Chair, I think this, you know, removing the word potentially uh, is dangerous because uh, it gives the estate office the right to label somebody a vexatious complainant, not just a potential one, without going through the due process. And being labelled a, a vexatious complainant has got lots of implications and outcomes like being forced to have a single point of contact with the council through whom you direct in order to avoid messing up officers. So it's quite a serious label to put on somebody, whereas to, to identify something as potentially vexatious in order that you can later demonstrate a cumulative effect that actually, and you can take to a, to a very senior officer and say, look, they, they've made, they're, they're calling us 10 times a day, they are clearly vexatious, here's the proof. Um, you know, I, I think actually the word potentially is necessary here, and I, I think taking it out probably is unwise. Uh, uh, sage counterposition, um, and I'm now confused because I hear wisdom on on all sides, but to a different end. Um, members, and would you like to come back in on that? Yeah, could I suggest that, that this is oh, that's taken away, and that one of the legal officers has another look? Yes. Because in a moment like this, do we have to take a decision today? Is there any pressing urgency to reach? I, I don't think there's a pressing urgency, Chairman. I'm happy to take it away and look at it tonight and then report before I retire. <laughs> We're not going to let you well, go until this not. is resolved. And, I mean, what are we trying to achieve essentially? Is it because there's been ambiguity and we're trying to bring clarity? Mm. Is that the correct position? If I can, um, if I can refer back to the previous March 2018 protocol, the, the the base which was previously approved, what we were trying to do is to be very clear that we would only accept complaints from people that would have been directly affected by this breach. So, for instance, just seeing someone have some wooden floor delivered in a block somewhere else wasn't enough for your complaint to be valid so you had to be affected by the by the nuisance of that breach so um and i i think where we've taken out some wording perhaps we've created uh created this problem so it'd be really helpful alan um if if we could look at that uh one last time so, so we're not going to let alan retire until he's nailed that for us I, I, um, absolutely I think, not I think I think the reference to complainant was an attempt in 2018 to sort of line up this protocol with the concept of vexatious litigant, where you do actually have a list of people the courts are aware of who litigate for the sake of it. I think that's what this is designed to pick up. Um, I take your point about um, 
freedom of information. I'll look at that. Um, but I think I, I'm with Anne on this. I think potentially introduces too much subjectivity. I mean, a complaint is either vexatious or it's not. And I think if you've got someone who's constantly making vexatious complaints, then they, the BEO needs to be aware of those people. In the same way that a court is aware of vexatious litigants, the court declares them vexatious and they're limited then in what they can do subsequently. Yes, and also, I mean, Polly's making a good point about informing somebody if you feel that they are vexatious, but, but then there is a point that you know somebody might be vexatious in the sense that they don't normally have a sort of a negative consequence from seeing somebody sort of in another block having wooden floor delivered. But then if 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 a wooden floor is delivered to the people living above them and they do have a consequence, is there not a possibility that we will then essentially have marked their card and not treat uh, a, a correct complaint? With due well, diligence. I think in that case, Chairman, it wouldn't be considered vexatious because the installation of a floor in the flat directly above may very well have direct consequences on that lessee. I think exactly. so what it comes it's trying back to, to catch is, is someone who sees a wooden floor being delivered in the block next door and decides it's time to make a complaint when the people living underneath the flat might have absolutely no interest in it whatsoever. Yes, so we could begin to think about on, under what circumstances does somebody have a kind of a legitimate complaint? What is their proximity? What is the harm they suffer? And once we think about those things, we can come to a kind of a clearer position rather than perhaps the general to the specific. I'm, I'm probably rambling here. It's uh, say Monday here. So one very pedantic question, first of all. Uh, could I have a definition of these vexations? I'm not quite sure what I mean, I know what a complaint is, but what is a vexatious complaint? And then I have another question after that. Thank you. Thank I think you. The vexatious complaint. The vexatious bears its ordinary meaning, and without looking it up, I think it is designed to vex the person to whom it's addressed. Right. Or okay. in the case of a court, yeah. the court. So if if you look up the Oxford English Dictionary definition of vexatious, then that will be the definition that applies in circumstances such as that's this. illegal. That, that would be. I mean, it sounds it, it's just the law using the ordinary use right. of words okay. just Thank for change. Yes. And I know certainly from experience, there is always someone who's going to say make a fuss about something. My other question is um, <clears throat> um, when we lived in the Barbican, it was always a little bit confusing that if I understand correctly, what we're saying is it's perfectly OK for anyone to put in a wooden floor as long as it doesn't cause any problems for anyone else. The only thing is that um, in future years, I think there might be a problem because almost every uh, advert for a new flat for sale, for example, in flat Frank Harris, has a wooden floor. You very rarely see any carpeting. So this, this is going to happen more and more. And then if someone moves in and they're very heavy footed or they wear um, stilettos or, or just make a lot of noise, then there, there could be problems. Um, uh, and I'm just a bit concerned that, that there's no real, we're sort of saying, oh yeah, you can have a wooden floor, but on the other hand, you can't have a wooden floor, um, unless, you know, if you make a problem. And I think that's a little bit confusing. Thank you. I'm on medication, but I think this is, um, th this is quite fascinating. It could drive lawyers mad because it's not necessarily the floor, then it's how the floor is used. I think Judith is going to jump in and prevent us getting all vexatious. I think the, the issue of vexations is the repeat use of activity rather than the sole, sole engagement about somebody's wooden floor. So I think we need to take this conversation away and give a bit more flesh to the bones of it. Um, and then we can perhaps pick up some of the things that John's just flagged. But vexations is not about a one-off incident. It's about a repeated incident from the same person time and time again. Uh, the language vexatious may be. And that, that then I think dispenses the issue of potentially or not because we've defined the, the issue a bit better. Thank you. Marvellous. Well, let's bring Steve in for a final word. Uh, oh, right, OK. Um, well, well, Joe, I think you, you hit the nail on the head. What are we trying to achieve here? Um, it seems to me that some time ago um, that we had a very clear um, view that um, uh, leaseholders could not have pets, could not have wooden floors. And then what we tried to do before our time was try to say, well, maybe there are Maybe it's OK sometimes um, to do that as long as you're not upsetting one of your neighbours. Um, but it seems that I can see lots of problems with with this lack of clarity. Um, as John says, what happens if a new neighbour moves in who might have a problem with the wooden floor that the, uh, the previous neighbour didn't? 
Um, and also, what happens if I've got a wooden floor and the person below me is objecting, and yet my mate down the road's got exactly the same wooden floor as me, um, but their neighbour's not objecting? So, so I do think we're getting ourselves into quite a, a, a complex um, uh, thing here, um, but we already got ourselves into it six or seven years ago, so maybe it's not. this isn't the time to completely escape. But it, I think maybe what we need to have, not today, but in the future, is some direction of travel about what the conditions of leasehold should be in the Barbican. Um, uh, because as John says, there's lots of, of wooden floors. There's increasing number of pets around the Barbican as well. So I think maybe it's something that we could review again um, in the not too distant future. It sort of acts as a foil into a conversation about the leases themselves, if we're considering the enforcement. Um, Alan, you've been stalwart for over 20 years. I can see you're going to be like the man in the iron mask. We will have you in a cell um, uh, working away right the way through. Um, but yeah, thank you. So in terms of, you know, we don't need to resolve it today, but yeah, uh, Alan is going to bring back a paper, I think, you know, for our next meeting and so someone will present that um, and we will go into this more deeply. But yeah. Thank you all for all the work that's gone in, John. Thank you, Chair. Just one final thing. <clears throat> Since we're talking about uh, uh, lease enforcement, there's no mention um, about short-term holiday lets. Has that all been finalised? Is someone looking out for Airbnb and that's now been stopped completely? Do we know? Thank you. Right. Helen, over to you. Thank you, Chairman. Just to come back to Mr Foley's previous point, um, if I can draw your attention to um, point 12, for the avoidance of doubt, if new leaseholder moves in and complains of a breach that has been in place for many years that has not caused a nuisance and or annoyance to the previous leaseholder, this will still be subject to the same enforcements. Um, the, the, other, the other point um, with regards to Airbnbs, we do occasionally um, have them reported to us if we're able to identify the property, obviously we do um, deal with the leaseholder on, on those as well. Sometimes it can be quite hard to work out which flat is actually involved. And just a final point about this report. So this, this is about lease enforcement of a nuisance rather than lease enforcement of, of wooden floors. Um, so it's, it's about how we deal with the nuisance of the wooden floor rather than the wooden floor itself, if that's clear. Thank you. Marvellous. Um, talking of nuisance, I do have to get back to my family at some point. Uh, so I think we have a way forward, even if not a resolution. Uh, item 12 in that case, which is, uh, I mean, our members contend that the decision is essentially to defer. Um, item 12, the Brandon News Canopy. Helen, I think you're going to guide us through this. Thank you. So um, this report was actually written by uh, Rosalind uh, be before she left us. So this just brings together all the um, the discovery uh, over the past year with regards to the the canopy, how it was installed and um, previous decisions about it. Um, uh, happy to answer questions if I can and also uh, defer to my colleagues here. Thanks. And again, essentially, this is highlighting a question we're going to have to face at a later date, I think. But Helen, over to you. I think that's ex exactly the point. I mean, it's quite an interesting hist log of history, but I kind of read it and thought, well, so what? So what do we do now? So um, helpful to have it all together in one place. But what I'm more interested in is what we do now. So who can guide us on that? Dan. Thank you, Chair. So the information that Rosalind's pulled together is obviously sort of a, a history of, of the canopy and, and how we've got to where we are today. Um, that is being taken away and, and reviewed so that we have a position uh, as the city on essentially the, the finance responsibility for that so that it can then come to, to committee for decision. Interesting information here, which I imagine, you know, sorry, the pertinent elements of this information will be presented again to committee when we come to a proper decision. Um, and it does appear that we need to sort of nail some of these points of debate and discussion, but but we don't need to nail them yet. Is that right, Dan? Correct. And when it comes to a decision, it will be in a, a more concise and, and bite sized way so we can go through it and understand it um, and, and what the, the position of the city is. Yes, thank you, Dan. So our members content if we move on to the next item. Um, so page 83 for decision, the Barbican Poston roof, roof renewal. Uh, Jason, over to you. 
Thank you, Chair. Um, so this is just tackling one of the many issues of water penetration across the state, uh, but in the sense that this is more immediate and requires action to uh, remedy the water penetration currently going into property. So um, uh, open the, uh, up to questions, uh, Chair, if that's OK. So the decisions are on page 83, 1, 2 and 3 at the foot of the page. Um, and yes, we're trying to get to the kind of the underlying root causes, but we are occasionally having to deal with the kind of the immediate, the here and now. Um, members, do you have any questions? Before we move to decide this. The only question I have is, have we, you know, is there any risk of us sort of drifting over these budgets, do you feel, or are we, you know, pretty realistic? Uh, Skateway two at the moment, Chair, so hopefully this is um, fairly low risk uh, at this stage, but certainly that needs to be reviewed more regularly as the project progresses. Yeah, so in terms of item one, that's tight, but then uh, we'll keep under review the other points. Members, any other questions? Well, in that case, are you content to um, to give assent to those decisions? Marvellous, and we are indeed, Jason, so thank you very much for your help on that. Um, moving on to item 14, the access to information for Barbican Works, and I think on page 95 you have three options. We're not having to decide formally, but we are invited to discuss and perhaps opine. Um, who's going to talk us through this? Is that right, Pam? Yes, it's me, Chair, thank you. Um, so for um, some time now, there's been an ongoing issue at the Barbican where um, the way that we apply the cost of major repairs means that everybody in a particular house pays a share of, say, a major window replacement or something like that. And it's been a, a frustration, particularly uh, talking to the Ben Johnson House Group, who've had a lot of repairs, um, that they do not know, have not been allowed to know which actual address that uh, repair applies to. Um, and we looked at, um, I wrote this report, we, we had talked to the controller before and there was some thought that we could, um, we needed to find a way to, to make this work. And I then went back to the controller and very helpfully data controller as well. And they came up with these three options. So the first one is, possibly I would say the most straightforward, although it involves work by the city. So it applies the concept of legitimate interest, that obviously those people in that uh, uh, house have a, a legitimate interest in the number that the property has been, been fixed or had works done to it. Um, the second one is that we would, if we don't go down that route, legitimate interest route, sorry, just also requires a change to our privacy notices, which people could object to. Um, so that's that's the caveat on that one. The second one is that we go to get consent from all residents of a house. So we consult them all and they give their consent to sharing their personal data. Um, and obviously, if you go for that route, obviously we do that work, but people could have would still have a right to withdraw that consent at any time. Then the third option was that, um, so awkward word to pronounce, pseudonymized, I think, think I've said it right. Um, so we would give some more information, but not the actual. So, so instead of saying number three, say the top right flat or something like that, you know, which, which well, <laughs> quite possibly. Um, so um, to make it clear, I mean, it just sort of almost doesn't quite serve any particular purposes um, unless you, um, because by the time you, if you give too much information, you might as well give the address in the first place, I would say. So it's, so the idea is that um, if people could, uh, members could give us their advice today on which one of these to pursue, then we can uh, pursue it with colleagues um, in the controller's office. So are we sort of framing the principles that will guide the decision? Is that what we're sort of being asked to sort of strike a balance between either sort of openness and pragmatism? Or well, which one you, which one, you, I, having talked to the Ben Johnson group, they thought the first one was the most likely to satisfy their interest. But obviously we, we, we do then have to go out to, uh, to change our privacy notices. So it's just making members aware of there is a balance there. And in terms of being pragmatic, it seems to be their interpretation that really is as important as anyone else's in this because it's their protection, their information that we're looking at. That's right. Yeah, yeah. yeah if members are content, it seems like we're towards one. Towards the end, though, we 
talk about the implications. Um, and I think resource implications, as Polly very kindly pointed out to me, refer to staffing costs for option two to test opinion. Are there any resource implications from the other options that we need to be mindful? Um, I haven't I haven't yet. Um, obviously, we, we know that there would be um, a cost of declaring this legitimate interest. But obviously, if we go for that one, then we can go away and do a bit more work on what it, what it would actually cost. But I, the, the controller's office didn't seem to be um, horrified by the thought of doing that. Great. So, I mean, if members are content, just, you know, they might wish to open up questions and other ideas. Perhaps we proceed to being informed and, and given a decision to take in, in uh, our, our next meeting. Um, guiding potentially, I mean, if you test legitimate interest, that option one, but give us the other options, but with maybe a little more clarity on the you know, contending resource implications, but we seem to have a direction of travel, which is towards one, unless members jump in and correct me. Marvellous. Are we content to move on to the next item then? which is verbal updates. Um, Helen, I think you're going to take us through the first, the Bob Consalve. Thank you. Yes, so Barbara can salvage um, for, for new members. This is a resident volunteer group that looks after original fixtures and fittings uh, that are coming out of properties. If someone's doing up their kitchen or bathroom, for instance. Uh, so they are running quite low on stock and we ha had held a meeting with them uh, in January uh, to work out uh, if there are any ways that we could could help promote promote this group um, and, and try and increase their stop. So it's a really useful meeting that we held. Um, there are actions for the BEO, there are actions for the group, and um, we've got uh, some documents currently sitting with colleagues in city solicitors uh, just prior to uh, coming back, which will be further publicised. Thank you. Great, thank you, Helen, for updating us and also for driving this. It seems like a really interesting way of aligning resident interest with corporation you know, consideration for the fabric. So thank you for driving that. Um, members, any questions on Bob can salvage? In which case we'll move to Blake Tower, Judith. Yes, thank you. So uh, I think members are aware that Blake Tower is um, something that the uh, corporation owns as a freehold, but um, that's the work is delivered by Red Row. They developed 74 flats uh, in 2015-16. The work has not been satisfactory and is currently subject to an improvement notice from the corporation, which was issued in December. Um, we're taking a number of tax just to make sure that we, um, we encourage Red Row to make the progress that our residents need to see. Uh, that includes obviously the improvement notice, uh, the the policy chairman has written to uh, Michael Gove, the Secretary of State, in December, and he received a response on the 28th of March, which was reassuring in terms of um, confirmation that Red Row are taking responsibility for improvements. As officers, we've um, we've commissioned specialist surveys. We've um, done some joint work with Red Row most recently on the 27th of March. We've got progress meetings with Red Row, and we're engaging in regular conversations with residents. So we're um, we're taking this issue seriously and trying to drive a resolution that's satisfactory for residents and obviously keeps the corporation's um, um, assets um, safely regarded. Great, thank you, Judith, and um, your teams and and indeed their predecessors, Paul Murter, I think, are particularly on this for you know, establishing an agenda and driving it forward. Um, there's a lot more to be done. Um, I think in our private sessions, I've given my thoughts about Red Row. Um, they're not on my Christmas card list anyway, but. Um, but um, and I, I, I think residents will be delighted that you know, the corporations pick this up. It's in line with the you know, policy chairman's commitment to resident research. Um, anything else on Blake Tower? That's right, we'll move on to the car parking and police storage, Judith. Just for members awareness, uh, the, the police have asked us for storage in um, 500 square metres in the Barbican car park. So that's something we're starting to ex explore with them. We're, we're scoping out their requirements and we'll be discussing it further with residents and members as we as we proceed. Thank you. Great. And we are mindful of m resident interest in that and, and that they receive some sort of. Absolutely. We flagged it with residents at the, the RCC last time. Marvellous. Thank you, Judith. Um, Pam, Playgrounds. Yes, Chair, just say there was concern because we um, closed a playground while it was being surveyed and we opened it as soon as the survey told us that it was fine. We are doing some repairs to that playground. 
Damon, I don't know if you've got any other updates on it. Uh, thanks, Pam. No, just to say that all playgrounds have had their full inspection. There was some low level works identified, but not enough to keep them closed or to close them. Thank you very much for engaging with that. All um, right. In that case, we can move on to item 16, antisocial behaviour. Gosh, we've had vexation, antisocial behaviour. I think anyone opening the minutes of this committee in you know, 300 years time will think that the Balkan is a sink of depravity. But um, Judith, can you take us through this item? Yeah. First? This is uh, this is a citywide rather than Barbican specific antisocial behaviour policy. It pulls together the approach uh, across uh, the city for using the powers and tools available. It's um, not describing a definitive list of what antisocial behaviour is because it's very much about the intent, the impact and the level of harm that's determined, which indeed links with the vexatious conversation that we had earlier. Uh, the law, law is very clear that we must be proportionate and appropriate in using powers, and I think this policy defines those well. Uh, there are lots of nuisance issues which would fall below the threshold of antisocial behaviour, and the document describes um, of those processes. So the next step for us, for, for Barbican residents, is to turn this into a leaflet, and we've, we've discussed that. Thank you. Great, thank you, Judith. So a leaflet locally, policy and resources will drive this reframing through, if necessary, to the Court of Common Council. Um, and yeah, I mean, it has, as, as Judith suggested, completely wider implications across the square mile. But um, I think a word of tribute is deserved to our former colleague, David Bradshaw and his team, who've been very, very much establishing an evidence base for the, you know, the extent of the problem locally and pressing the corporation generally to uh, to attend to this. So um, thank you, David. Uh, if you happen to be watching, you've, you've been a sterling colleague and uh, former colleague on this. Um, members, any questions before we proceed onwards? Um, in which case, Anne, oh yes, sorry. Um, in view of the current pets policy consultation, I wondered if we need to be mindful of that when it says what is not antisocial behaviour in point 2.5 um, because it does say occasional dog barking that actually might change <laughs> in the future. Um, I think occasional dog bark barking would never be antisocial behaviour. It's acceptable but if dogs do end up living with, amongst us it might not be so occasional. Thank you. I think the word is occasional which would be linked to a dog rather than um, rather than multitudinous dogs, but I think that our consultation is about HRA properties rather than the Barbican estate. Thank you. Mention another part on the equality and diversity side, um, where it says about demonstrating that we've considered any vulnerability identified. Um, some vulnerable people are victims. Um, I just wondered if we should mention how this is demonstrated, i.e. sort of a risk assessment or like an impact assessment, because actually some people are actually on the on the victim side of, um, I don't know, things like cuckooing and stuff like that. Absolutely. One of one, you know, to check point 19. Absolutely, we take our safeguarding concerns very seriously in terms of people with, um, with additional needs and vulnerabilities. Thank you. Way we can just just in case I mean policy and resources is famed for its thoroughness and depth but um, is there any way we can just point that out or, or flag that up for PNR because it's a good point um, is that okay Judith yeah that's fine thank you marvelous thank you very much any other points on this in that case we'll move on to item 17 um, sales and lettings and uh, thank you chairman this is the usual report to the committee um, uh, as an update, one of the sales of the tower blocks has uh, completed since the report. Great, thank you. Um, any questions, members? Right, moving on to RIAs. It's um, introduced in public, but of course anything that might be sensitive is considered in private session. But and any points you wish to make on page one, two, nine? Um, uh, no, Chairman, as, as I say, we can take more, more questions um, in the private section. Members, are you content to proceed onwards to questions? In that case, uh, members, do you have any? Barb. Thank you. Um, you may know that there has been a generator 
landed on Silk Street. Um, this is for Linklaters who had a power outage. It's affecting residents in Cromwell and Speed. It's spilling out, polluting homes with diesel, plus the noise of the generator itself. I understand that it was poor communication. This just happened just before Easter holidays. I understand that there's poor communication for residents. Um, going forward, Link Lakes have now agreed to stop running it during the night. And I understand that it's also going to have a vegetable based fuel incorporated into it. Reading um, the link latest reply, it does say that it sought advice and the correct permits from the pollution control team. Um, just asking how this was allowed to happen. Which, which of the members, oh, which of the officers rather is going to take that question? Uh, yeah, we, so we uh, did set up a communication uh, on Friday in the bulletin for Balkan residents um, with, with the information that we had. Um, we, uh, as in uh, myself and the officer to the left of me, um, are going to be in touch with, with Linklaters in terms of uh, moving forward. Um, we just want to understand how they can operate um, w without the generator at night, considering it's going to be powering the life safety systems, etc. And if it's entirely necessary, it needs to be in the, in the day in that case. Um, in terms of uh, approvals, um, I'll have to take that away um, and come back to you on what approval was given by by which department? So whether our approvals process is robust and which department leads it. Dan, are you OK maybe emailing us before our next meeting with a bit of guidance on that? All, all members, if that's all right. Yep, absolutely. Um, thank you very much. Um, any other questions, members? In that case, Judith has perhaps one of the least fascinating questions ever. Just um, Judith, could you give us a quick update on how policy and resources is treating the Barbican? Um, you know, the, the point that Mark Bostock made about one Barbican estate and that sense of the Barbican area, um, because I think there are some developments afoot, aren't there? Thank you. Yes. So the, the Barbican Residential Committee um, plus passed a resolution a year ago, I think, asking for a more joined up approach to the Barbican estate. Um, one of my colleagues has done extensive consultation and engagement with stakeholders across the Barbican and is now presenting to PNR a report uh, recommending that members select one of three options. The, the favoured option is option B, which is to um, have a more joined up approach through, through um, enhancing the Barbican Area Advisory Committee. Uh, this group would avoid du duplication of creating a new body um, and we would engage better with residents just to, to strengthen that resident engagement. So that's a conversation for PNR, but and regardless of the decision of PNR will make sure that the uh, Barbican Residential Committee and RCC are engaged in, with the work of the Barbican Strategy Group. Thank you. Thank you very much. So essentially trying to go to the points that Mark Bostock has made in the past about uh, a joined up approach to the Barbican um, without overlaying cost or complexity. So it seems like a pragmatic way forward, but we will find out at our next meeting. Um, and touching on that, um, could we have some thoughts around the columbarium? I, I think it is, and essentially, for members who aren't familiar, uh, at the church there are memorials to um, former parishioners, including a former Lord Mayor, that are getting a little bit dilapidated. I think Father Jack uh, would like to propose what seems like a fairly pragmatic way of addressing that. Um, but if we look at the cost from a corporation point of view of attending to it, they tip in at a certain point and we've just got to work out whether we're perhaps being overly formalistic in how we're approaching this. So who's going to be able to talk us through the columbarium? Is that you, Helen? I think yes. um, oh. uh, yes, so we we've um we've looked um uh, at having some work done there um as a temporary measure. Um but uh the and the cost is with um other officers. I know uh, Pam and I visited, I think, just before Easter, Pam. So, uh, yeah, thank you. So we're trying to establish whether it's a corporation responsibility. If it is a corporation responsibility, is it a responsibility for the BRC? But at the same time, to avoid further dilapidation and have a reasonably pragmatic outcome. But but um, how are we going to move that forward? Or indeed, are we? Chairman, if, if I may, 
Um, between call over and this committee, I had a look at the lease and the lease granted by the city to the church is of the church hall and the columbarium and the obligation to maintain repair and keep in good order the columbarium rests with the church. And I seem to remember, um, I don't know if Anne does as well, it must be about 20 years ago, I think at one point the church approached the city for a grant to try and waterproof the church hall, but it never went anywhere. So that seemed to suggest that the, the church sort of agrees with our interpretation of this. And how are we going to live without you? That is incredible diligence in the space of one lunch time to clarify that. Thank That's you. It's actually old age, Chairman. <laughs> I'm nearly as long old as the lease. But your your good graces with the church have fallen before you retire. I'm not sure whether that's a good idea. However, you know, I think we would we well, I suppose this is a conversation for further down the line. So what we're saying is responsibility lies with the church, but clearly the church has been able to approach the corporation in the past for support when there are works that need to be done. So perhaps that's how we root it and invite Father Jack, if you happen to be listening, to um, call us and um, have a conversation. Um, otherwise, we will drop him a note. Um, thank you very much all. Um, those are the only questions that I was aware of. Members, do you have any others? Right. Um, in that case, are you content to move to the exclusion of the public? And with great thanks to the members of the public, BA, RCC, who've attended. Thank you all very, very much.